Hello, Diana Initiative. Welcome to our noon talk on the stage three. I'm uh, Jeff Breiner coming to you from Portland, Oregon. Just a couple of quick reminders and we'll get uh, right into the talk. So very quickly, uh, thanks again to our sponsors. Without these sponsors, this doesn't happen. Uh, so be sure to stop by the Expo Hall and say hi to them. Uh, maybe you're only a chance to meet face to face with some of these folks uh, during a pandemic, of course. <laughs> And a quick program note, so we're delaying the closing keynote by a half hour today, just in order to give all the tracks and sessions time to finish up so that uh, everyone can attend the closing keynote. So that'll be uh, Gatekeeping, Gaslighting, and Grieving, uh, given by Kirsten Brager. It's at uh, 4.30 Pacific time uh, p.m. on the main stage, stage uh, one. And, uh, and now I'm thrilled to introduce uh, Emily, Emily Kroos, to take us through a deep dive into spycraft and walk us through how to make a microdot. Emily's been in information security for over 10 years. Previously, she's worked at CIA, NSA, U.S. Army, INSCOM. And in her free time, she runs the Hacking History Project and co-authors the Teletypist. Take it away, Emily. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to my talk. So today I'm going to be giving you a talk on how to make microdots. Um, so I've titled this, So I Made a Microdot. Uh, so let's get into who I am just to start with. Uh, my name is Emily Kroos. <clears throat> I'm a senior industrial pen tester at Dragos Incorporated. We uh, do industrial pen testing. In the evenings, I just wreak havoc on things. Um, my Twitter is there at hexadecimate. Um, and if you are looking for me on LinkedIn, please don't, don't try and find me. Um, okay, so a uh, table of contents, just to give you an overview of what we're gonna be talking about. Um, so in the first, this is gonna be divided up into three parts. There's gonna be uh, a part about history, um, kind of like the what is of a microdot. The second part is gonna be microdot production, how we actually create the microdot. Um, and then the third part is modern use. So why, why are we doing this and why would it be useful today? Uh, before we get started, I want to address uh, one, of the, one of the most prolific members of the security community Fred Durst, who once said, if you want to know how not secure you are, just take a look around. Nothing's secure. Nothing's safe. I don't hate technology. I don't hate hackers because that's what comes with it. Without those hackers, we wouldn't solve the problems that we need to solve, especially security. I think if we all take a moment to really reflect on that statement, we'll understand the why of why I decided to do this. So what is the point of using this ages old, 100 plus year old technology? What possible use could it have today? And as we as we go through the slides that will explain to you the history and the how to, just keep in mind that um, there doesn't need to be a reason for, for everything that you do. Um, this just happened to be something that I have a little bit of personal interest in. Um, and, and actually it was, it, it started as something that I wanted to do for the first issue of the teletypist and didn't, uh, really, I didn't think that I could do it. So in a way doing this was kind of my way of proving to myself that I could, that I could do anything that I really wanted to, even if it seemed like totally useless or totally off the wall. So thank you, Fred Durst for restoring my confidence, uh, in, in myself. Um, okay. So about what, what exactly is a microdot like maybe you've heard the term and you're not exactly sure what it is well a microdot is this thing i am trying desperately to pick up here this is a microdot it's not visible probably on your end but i i assure you that i'm holding a microdot and i have also lost this microdot uh four times in the past uh, 12 hours trying to experiment with actually picking it up with a, a, a set of tweezers so microdot is essentially uh, an entire takes an entire page worth of information like this, an entire legal page, and it shrinks it down into uh, a very small space. This this technology is not new. It's it's been around for a very long time. Um, as I said, it's over 100 years old. Uh, if we if we really were to go back and and try and find exactly where it started, we would find that a microdot was um, invented in the late 1800s. Uh, so it's not it's not new by any stretch of the imagination. Um, here's here's a, a photo of some microdots that were seized. I believe this is like a, a Cold War, World War II photo. Um, this is a series of microdots uh, taken without magnification, I believe. And um, 
this was, uh, you can actually find this one on the Wikipedia for the National Security Agency. So it's it's out there and available, but this is essentially what I just held up with the tweezers. It's a, it's just a series of them all taped to a piece of paper or glued, probably glued to a piece of paper. Um, the earliest examples that we have of microdots being used in military technology for an actual like real practical purpose um, would be with, if you're familiar with RFC 2549, um, the QOS over avian carriers, uh, which is a kind of a tongue, it's a tongue in cheek RFC, but this actually was the, the um, this was the, the OG way of, of trans transferring information uh, from one place to another uh, using carrier pigeon. So what microdots essentially allowed us to do during World War I is to send more information or, or essentially increase the bandwidth over your avian carrier by shrinking down the, the the packet size, so to speak, and uh, and allowing it to attach to a, a, a carrier pigeon um, or homing pigeon much more uh, easily than something that was much larger. Uh, the the normal way of doing this would be to print it out onto a very small slip of paper. There's a little bit more weight attached to that, but with a pigeon, uh, every ounce counts. I just made that up. So um, doing micro dots is kind of just a more um, it's a more natural, uh, low overhead way of, of transferring information from one place to another. Um, but by the, by the time we get to the Second World War, microdot technology has changed quite a bit. And, uh, and it turns out it's the, the uses have changed quite a bit as well. So uh, on, the, on the images that you can see here on the left, there's a picture of, a, uh, I believe this is a German produced um, microdot camera that's produced specifically for the purpose of creating microdots. Um, on, the on the right side, you see an envelope with um, actual microdots attached to it. You can probably barely see it, but if you look very closely at the open flap of the envelope in the middle of the, not the top part, but actually the, the center fold part of the envelope, there's a very small red circle and inside that red circle is maybe three or four microdots attached to the page. So those are actually even smaller than the ones that I produce in, in this um, for this presentation. Um, this was this was in the this I believe is the, in the FBI collection, um, and I, I believe this is also an example of German microdot technology. Um, but the the reason in in World War II and, and further into the future is for more uh, covert um, message transfer. So. Whereas the pigeons were were also in a form of uh, a form of covert message transfer, um, the that was really that wasn't really the the primary driver for why they were being used. Um, the primary driver was just for uh, for for short field communications where radios may not be ubiquitous. Um, so there are there are some very prominent examples post World War II where microdots were used for espionage purposes. Um, the man on the left is uh, James Stockdale. James Stockdale was a downed pilot during the um, uh, during the Vietnam War. He was kept in Holo Prison. You probably know it as the Hanoi Hilton. What you may not know about James Stockdale, um, Stockton, if you or Stockdale, if you don't know of of him uh, as a person, uh, Stockdale was recruited by the CIA to um, send messages uh, from the prison and report on conditions of prisoners. He was also taking information from the agency at the time as well. Um, Stockdale was um, more or less recognized as the organizer inside Hololo for the, his stay there. Um, he was the, he was actually in the Hanoi Hilton from 1965 to 1973. So for quite a while, uh, he was the CIA's go-to guy for organizing messages in and out of the prison. Um, so, so there's there's a an evolution of microdot technology that leads up to from from Stockdale to the man that we see on the right side. Um, the man on the right side is named Adolf Tolkachev. Um, you may recognize Tolkachev as um, uh, the billion dollar spy is kind of as he is popular known popularly known. Um, Tolkachev was a Soviet placed um, science officer who used uh, a variety of methods to take photos of um, uh, sensitive documents and got them back to his CIA handlers during the 1970s. I believe he was arrested in the early 80s by uh, Soviet 
Um, hey, Tracy. So we have folks. Hi. Sorry. Um, so, uh, yeah, so we, we have quite a few examples of market dots being used throughout the Cold War. Um, and in kind of coming into their own as a technology for transferring secrets. We also have some non-espionage examples that exist kind of throughout this time period where they're being used. Um, on the far right, you'll notice something that uh, it may be something that looks familiar to you. It's a, it's a very small um, uh, book like thing with a micro dot inside of it that just contains the Lord's Prayer. Um, if you look through the, the lens there, you'll see a very small um, and a large, an enlargement of a very small uh, copy of the Lord's Prayer on the inside of the book. And piece, people also use this technology for all kinds of different things, like um, like in the middle image where there's just a, a picture of a loved one. Um, same sort of effect there. If you look through the lens, you'll see the the picture on the on the inside. But also uh, porn. People liked to have porn on them. I, I don't understand uh, why you would need such a thing anywhere you go, but I guess phones kind of changed our the way that we consume that uh, type of imagery. Uh, so on the far left there, you see just an, an, uh, a very miniaturized uh, pornographic picture from the early early days. Um, so um, microdot production. So this is where things get kind of fun, and I'm, I'm sure why ultimately a lot of folks uh, came to this, this presentation. So in my experimentation here, I did this uh, with two stages. Um, the first stage will produce a micro dot that's uh, a little bit larger than the one that I showed earlier. And as I try to take it out of my cap here, you should get a micro dot that's about this size. So this is 1.5 centimeters in length. Um, not, I call this a, ma a macro dot. So it's not quite a micro dot, but still probably useful for some um, standard purposes. Um, maybe where you don't necessarily... Um, Th this to me is is the kind of um, this is the the method of of micro dot technology where if it you may not you may not be having somebody giving you too much scrutiny but maybe just enough that they might find something like this um, the information shouldn't be terribly sensitive if you're using it but I, this is actually a copy of the one that you see on the um, in the on the left image and then the two stage um, the one on the right image that I showed earlier that's three millimeters in length. So actually much, much smaller. Um, I would say just kind of reckoning, it's maybe it's maybe a sixth the size of the macro dot. So you can shrink down the image into, uh, into very small pieces depending on, on what your operational needs are. So the one stage method. Um, this one is actually is, is fairly easy to do, um, but what you do is you start with something worth taking a photo of. So uh, maybe this is one-time pad keys, maybe this is privileged information or just messages that you wanna get to or from somebody that's possibly under surveillance. Um, so to, to do this, you're gonna need a few different uh, types of materials. Um, in my case, I this is what I started with. This is just a, uh, this is just a, a, a forged uh, one-time pad. Um, I kind of reverse engineered this one. So I, I created the one-time pad after I created the message, um, this is something that I'm using for the teletypist. So it just, uh, I just kind of like um, did a keyboard walk and created this. Um, but I start with this image and then I start to gather up the other materials that I need. So I have a, a 35 millimeter camera. There's nothing special about this. This is just something that I've, I've had since like, I think I've had this camera since high school. Um, some high grain black and white uh, film is something else that you're going to need. So in this case, I just bought some 400 TX black and white uh, Kodak. It's it's cheap. I forget how much I paid for it. Um, and then I also had kind of a, a stack of materials in the in the image that you see on the right. So on the right, there is a, um, a cutting board, purple cutting board. Um, I also have an X-Acto knife. And underneath both of those things is a black poster board, which um, won't be used in the first, uh, the one stage method, but it'll be used in the, in a two stage. So just keep in mind that you saw that here because it's gonna, it's gonna come back in a, mo in a moment. Okay, so this is declassified from a CIA document. This is, this is kind of just um, demonstrating how we have to set up our shot. So in this picture, there's a, a, um, a Minox camera. This is a, a camera that's designed specifically for the purpose of creating microdots. 
Um, this, these were heavily used in the 1970s, but you can see these all over the place in uh, museums that have like old spy tech. Um, but these, the, essentially the idea here is that there's a, a, a piece of paper or um, a document that you want to take a photo of. Uh, there's a, a very handy little um, uh, stand that your camera can go on to, to hold it just far enough away from the, the page that you can take a photo of it and that it will be in focus when the micro dot is created after you take the photo. For my purposes though, because I was using a 35 millimeter camera, uh, which is more of the, the Adolf Tolkachev way of doing it, if you're familiar with that case, um, I just stood in my kitchen and, and took a photo of the, the subject document that I needed to take a photo of. Um, what you're trying to do here is to um, uh, get the, the piece of paper or the document that you want to photograph to fill the entire viewfinder, focus it, and then snap your photo. That's really all there is to it. Um, what you're going to produce there is a 35 millimeter negative that's a, that's a full-size 35 millimeter negative. Um, of just the document. So once you do that, then um, that that's that's essentially the first stage. Um, there are different ways of doing this. So just as kind of an addendum, if you wanted to make a much smaller micro dot, so if you wanted to um, if you wanted to end up with the with the one point five centimeter um, macro dot that I create here, what you would do essentially is increase the distance between the document and the camera lens. And um, there, there are lots of ways that you can do this. Uh, in, my, in my case, I used a very advanced technolo technological method called standing on my kitchen counter and um, taking a photo of it, just making sure that I could get the, the focus right on the document. Um, so this, this is you know, easy to do. Uh, if, you, if you had a situation or environment where you could do this, there's no reason not to do it this way. Um, Given enough focal length, you could do something like stand on a ladder as well and also get a similar result that would actually be much smaller, probably closer to the one millimeter um, or the 1.52 millimeter um, macro, micro dot, like true micro dot size. Um, but it's it's all about your setup and what type of camera that you're using. So the limit the limitations to miniaturization just on a on a stage on a one stage um, micro dot are your distance from the target, the focal length that you have, or how focused your lens is going to let you get, the film contrast, and then the practicality, like why why you would need a something that's much smaller versus something that's that's quite a bit larger. So um, some of these are techn are problems that you can solve through technology. And others, um, others are just, you know, more operational need type of uh, driven decision making. So it's really up to it's really up to you and your needs. If you do end up in a situation where you need something much smaller, though, film contrast and focal length are going to come uh, much more into play. In fact, all of these things will probably be um, much more difficult to do if you're in a, an operational environment where you need to have something that's that's quite a bit smaller than what I've uh, produced here from the one stage. But once you once you take your photo and you send it to the, the developers, what you're going to get back is is basically what you see here. So it's a 35 millimeter negative. Um, I have already cut off the bottom uh, reel holders, so that's you're, you're looking at just the um, just the bottom part cut off. But that's the only processing that's happened here. What you would do then is then put this into the, the cutting board, kind of cut it along the, the edge of the sheet, and you would have you would have a 35 mil, standard 35 millimeter frame with just the information that you needed to miniaturize on it. This is already quite a bit smaller than a legal pad. So if you can imagine what a 35 millimeter negative looks like versus a full size page of, of information, um, it's quite a bit smaller. So that alone may be all that you need operationally in order to um, get your information from one place to another, or to, uh, um, or or to even just um, maintain the information that you have in a state that's going to make it semi secure and easy to store. Uh, but again, operational needs here something that you probably want to take into account. This image is just a, a comparison between the the macro dot that I've created on the um, on the left and the standard 35 millimeter size. So 
as you can see here, it's maybe uh, one fourth the size the, the macro dot is of a standard 35 millimeter. I would add that definitely still readable through, by the human eye, um, just by the naked eye without having to magnify it at all. So I, you know, you can hold this thing up to uh, a clear sky and read the entire document if you needed to um, for, for either of the examples here, including the, the macro dot. So no advanced um, uh, magnification is needed in order to read the information that you have miniaturized. Um, Again, it's it's kind of just about where you want to put it, though. So, like, if you if you had a, a specific method in mind to transfer this information or a specific place that you needed to put it, um, the the smaller macro dot may be the best option for you. Um, but you'll you'll see an example in in coming slides of where you might want something that's kind of more in the middle of a a, a, a true micro dot one millimeter versus the the macro dot, so to speak. At um, maybe one, one and a half centimeters. But this is what the, this is what the macro dot looks like when you hold it up to a, a clear sky day. Um, I, I usually wear glasses, so it's not uh, eminently readable for me, but probably for many of you, you'll be able to actually see this. Um, this is uh, enlarged just slightly. So um, it's, ac it's actually a little bit bigger than, than the macro dot is uh, in true size uh, in the picture. Um, so there's uh, there there's a there's only a minor amount of magnification happening here, which means that even under um, more difficult circumstances where you don't have magnification, I mean you could move it closer to your eye and be able to see it um, just as easily. So okay, so who cares? What what do we do with one stage? Well, as I was saying before, if you had an operational need where you needed to transfer information um, on a macro dot you could put this kind of thing under a stamp. Um, so here's just kind of an example of how it would fit under a standard US postage stamp. Um, it would definitely fit there. You would just attach it to an envelope and the, the macro dot would be there. Not many people are gonna think to look at it there unless they are doing like counterintelligence work or are familiar with this method. Stamps are kind of a, a standard place to put mac, uh, micro dots, though. So if you're in a, a position of needing to transfer that information a little bit more discreetly, a stamp probably wouldn't be the best way to do it. Um, but then there's a two-stage method as well. So if you um, if you have two rolls of film and you develop the first one and you decide that you just need something that's a little bit smaller, you would move on to uh, the the two stage. So just to recap where we were with the end of the first stage, we ended up with a 1.5 centimeter um, negative that can be read with the human eye um, without any magnification. So you would take that, you would take that, cut it, that board, the black board that I told you about before that I told you was going to come back. You take your exacto knife and you cut out uh, a very small section for your either your one uh, one and a half centimeter macro dot or 35 millimeter um, standard negative which is what I, I used here actually um, I used an insulated foam board because uh, it, it actually held the negative better so it fits in the slot and it didn't move around very much um, in the process of attaching it to the lamp so you do need to backlight it and and I would just point out that this is this is a very uh, low cost setup here to produce the the micro dot by attaching it to by attaching the blackboard to um, uh, just a, a lamp in my in my work workroom um, that was enough backlighting to give me uh, an image that came through so I would stand maybe uh, three or four feet from the from the board focus it as best I could and take a photo. Now, the wisdom I would say about doing it this way is that uh, it doesn't always work quite the way that you would expect in practice. So um, the the instructions that I got were from an old book uh, on just like, it's one of those children's kind of children's book on spy technology, uh, like older spy technology. And this is, this is called the British method of micro dot creation. So the British method uh, says that when you go to do this part, that you should make sure that the that the negative is in focus. In reality, 
you're not really going to be able to focus this up in a way that's going to be done competently. So you kind of just have to do it as best you can and hope for the best at the end. Um, with more advanced technology, this kind of eliminates the problem of having to focus on something that's already small to begin with. Um, I will go over some ways to improve this process, though, if you were to uh, want to do this for something that's more um, like use around the house or whatever, if you've got a modern use for this. But this is this is the best that I could do. I still ended up with a result, though. And here's what it looks like. So when you get the film back after the the stage, the two stage method, you get your true micro dot. And this is as it appears on the on the actual negative. So when you get this back, it's really just a matter of doing the same thing that you did with the with the one stage. You um, cut very carefully around the edges, and this this is where the um, exacto knife comes in really handy. Um, just very carefully cutting the rectangle out and um, doing your best not to lose it, which seriously is um, a big headache with these. Um, one of my one of my consultant contacts on this project. John Mendez um, was explaining to me that you may just be in a situation where you, if you're, if you're doing this uh, back in the old days, they would have these problems where in the lab, they would have, um, they would have negatives that were this size and the micro dot would come back. And um, if somebody just kind of like sneezed in the wrong place or breathed the wrong way, it would just become dust and would disappear into, into the ether. So um, keeping track of micro dots is actually much more difficult even than you, than you may think. So, um, the, the, me the preferred method of transferring a micro dot from one place to another is to lick the fingertip, uh, dab, and then pick it up just like this. Uh, if you end up having to handle them, it's just a practical issue that you're gonna, you're gonna have to try to find a way to work around. Um, but this is ultimately what it looks like when you get it all cut out. So it, it literally is, um, it's smaller than my fingertip, um, which is why these things are so difficult to, to keep track of. So, um, so that's the two sta the two stage method. Um, there, there are practical differences between the one stage and the two stage method. Um, again, most of this is just going to be operations need driven. Maybe your need is just to, uh, to uh, retain some information so that it doesn't get lost and you don't want to, you don't want anybody to find it that this is, this is going to be a really, um, probably a more difficult option than the, than the macro dot is, uh, for just keeping track of it. Um, but I mean, I've, I've even talked to people who, um, maybe are ex military and they, if you know anybody or if you've been in the military yourself, I haven't been in the military myself, but I do know people who um, I've known a lot of folks who've gotten out of the military and your DD-214 is just something you can't, you can't ever lose that. You you can and you can get one back. But if you lose that document, um, it's going to cause some trouble for you. So um, I've known people print out a trillion copies of their DD-214 just to have them around. So maybe this is one thing that you want to do is take a, pic a picture of your DD-214 just so you have a million dust sized copies of it laying around. Um, but the, the, the obvious problem, once you get something the size is, okay, well, how am I going to, how am I going to read this? Um, this is not readable with the naked eye. Um, you can kind of see when something is etched to the photo, but it's, or to the negative, but it's not, it's not readable. Um, even, even just if you hold it super close to your eye, there's no way that you're going to be able to actually determine the difference between letters. So the way that, that professionals, um, uh, view micro dots is with the Stanhope lens. Um, the one in the upper left, uh, the, the metallic one is like one that you could wear around your neck, possibly. It's that's an antique Stanhope lens where you would just uh, put the, the uh, micro dot on the flat end and then you could read it through the, the curved end. Um, the, the more modern version of the, the antique Stanhope lens is one of those little, um, and most people have seen this, I think, like a little uh, gift box with maybe a picture or grain of rice or something that's had a picture put on it or um, a, a message written on it. You can just put it in a little plastic box like this and uh, and read the micro dot. Um, but they, they've also done, uh, put Stanhope lenses into 
things like uh, the ring that you see on the on the right side again uh, with with porn in it. Um, so there there are lots of different ways that you can um, maintain a micro dot and read it later on. Um, all of these are options that you can that are, are still uh, fairly readily available. So there's they're not too hard to get. Um, and then this is what it looks like under magnification. So if you wanted to look at the, the micro dot, what you would see is more uh, the image on the left side. Now, I will freely admit that my micro dot did not come out great. Um, it's not readable. It's not, it, it, you can see the difference in, in the micro dot and the macro dot in terms of readability. Um, and, I, and again, I will, I will explain how we can improve this operationally uh, in the future. Um, and then on the right side, there's uh, this is this is actually a, a smaller version of the macro dot that I was able to produce with the one stage method. Um, so we we did get one that was uh, quite a bit smaller, but not readable with the human eye or with the naked eye, and um, but but very readable under um, under magnification. So in this case, I put the micro dot and the macro dot into my son's antique microscope and uh, and looked at them that way. So, okay, so modern use. Um, there's, there's maybe a misconception that old technology has become obsolete and there's no reason to revisit them. Um, if that's kind of the camp that you're in, then I here's a meme for you. Um, my, micro dots are absolutely not played out technology. They're just in search of a new application is my nice way of putting this. So if you need to do, there's all kinds of different ways that you can use these things. Um, some some notes on operational security though, before we get into the, the more um, modern use cases. Uh, problems that we encountered during this process of so bandwidth, obviously the amount of information transferable is relatively small. It's, it's fairly labor intensive. Um, the development is something that you, you end up having to deal with because there's not, uh, there's not a whole lot of fo folks that are actually developing film in person anymore um, in a way that you can get the negatives from. And, um, and it's, also, it's also very low tech. So if you wanted to process something and take it from an analog state to a digital state, it's gonna be uh, definitely non-trivial to do that. Um, which maybe there's maybe there's benefits to to doing it that way. Um, again, all all up to your needs um, and how you apply the technology. Um, a note on the film development, though. So what I did was I ended up mailing out the negatives to uh, a film processor that did this relatively cheaply. I think each um, uh, each development job on the two rolls of film that I submitted to them were thirteen dollars a piece. So it's not it's not terribly expensive for this kind of one-off use case. It was, it was affordable for me just to have fun with. Um, if you had to do this at scale though, I wouldn't recommend using a, a micro dot, like a standard micro dot for this, a standard analog micro dot for this. Um, but so modern use cases, uh, maybe you have something like a Bitcoin key and you don't want to buy one of these big ridiculous chunks of metal to uh, inscribe your key onto this one was submitted to Reddit about oh, two weeks ago, and I found it. Um, somebody had uh, sent me this on Twitter and and kind of pointed out this this thing that somebody had found in a wall, and they weren't sure what it was. It turns out it's, it's probably a Bitcoin key. So um, what you would do with this is you you could uh, apply a microdot technology to make a miniaturized version of your Bitcoin key. So that you can store all your uh, your fake money securely that way. Um, you could also uh, save something like a one-time pad or a, a very sensitive set of keys that you don't want anyone to get a hold of. Um, you could save that to a, a micro dot and put it inside of something else. So in this case, there's all these stories of the KGB used to um, create one-time pads and then put them into concealment so that their their assets overseas could use them. Um, there's there's a, a particularly prominent one of the authorities going to um, investigate the house of a, a spy somewhere in West Berlin is like the closest I could find information on this. And um, the subject's house is completely empty of all food except for this big like pile of walnuts in the middle of their kitchen table. 
Um, and then, so when they started looking at the walnuts, they cracked, they cracked one open and found the one time pad. So, um, if you had like a specifically a, a particularly sensitive set of keys that you needed to keep a hold of that, um, uh, that you maybe didn't want to write by hand on a piece of paper or, um, printing it out in a, in a very a super small way, just didn't make sense. Um, micro dots might be a good solution for you. So there are a few modern uses for this technology um, that you you could you could easily get like a new a new sense of um, uh, application out of. There's also a, a, this concept of a digital micro dot, which is something that I'm kind of still playing around with. So with the uh, sorry about that with the um, the advent of of extremely of ultra high resolution imagery. You may have seen it where you can take a photo of a cityscape and zoom in from miles away on like the the type of like you, you could read a message on somebody's coffee mug. Um, that type of digital technology could easily be used and reapplied to create something that, that is akin to a digital microdot. Um, by hiding information in a in a an ultra high resolution image and just giving somebody um, who needs that information the exact um, mapping on the image where they need to look, you could encode information and hide it in, uh, in a digital image. Um, whether this is practical or not, again, just kind of boils down to your, your operational conditions. Um, it doesn't, you, you would be applying a digital technology for essentially very little, um, very little, uh, bandwidth in transferring of data. And that would also be fairly labor intensive as well. Um, I did have a slide, but I, I guess I must have passed over it. One thing that you're going to need to take a note of, um, kind of ways to improve for next time, is um, for, for my situation with the micro dot, I would have certainly used uh, a microfiche or a much more high contrast uh, film stock. That, that would have been that probably would have given me a true micro dot and something that's readable under magnification. So um, there, there were a number of suggestions made to me in the Twitter thread where I kind of like laid all of this out. Um, a lot of those film stocks are, are actually still available and relatively cheap. So if this is something that you want to reproduce, uh, get to me after and I can try and dig up that information. Um, but that would definitely be something I would improve for next time. Um, you could also uh, improve the focal length of your camera by getting a, a lens that would allow you to focus in on something that's much smaller. Um, there's a lot of different things that you could do to improve this process. Um, as somebody who's never made micro dots before, I learned a lot from this. Um, I learned a lot about the, the applications of technology that you could, or the applications to modern problems that you could uh, put this toward. So this was, for me, this is just a very fun kind of hackery experiment. Um, very, speaks very much to the ethos of just kind of doing something because you can and learning a lot from it. So if you're interested and you have some of these materials just kind of laying around the house, uh, there's there's really no, no good reason not to try it and see how you do with it. And now that you have um, the information on how to do it, um, then go forth and give it a try. Um, so I want to, before I, I go to questions, I do want to throw a special thanks out there to um, two people who helped me out here. So Donna Mendez and Dr. Vince Houghton um, gave me a lot of information. When I was doing the research for this, really all I had to start with because the techniques are not um, well known in, in public spheres. Um, all I had to start with was a snippet from a book that came from uh, a forum thread that pointed me to the, um, the, the, the kid's book on how to create micro dots. And even that was not very thorough. So a lot of this, I had to kind of piece through piece together through just trial and error and my best reckoning for how to, how to do it properly. So there's that again, is just kind of like another thing that speaks to the, the ethos of just throw stuff at the wall and you may learn something that is not common knowledge and maybe you can hand it out to, to other people who are interested. So that's my entire presentation. Uh, I believe I have like five minutes for questions. So if anyone has anything, um, uh, I'm, I'm open for questions now.
Great. Thanks very much, Emily. That was awesome. <laughs> we got a lot of good questions and even some dad jokes uh, in the chat going on when you're, uh, when you're talking. So let's uh, let's make through. There's a lot of really good questions that people have got here. Um, let's see. So first one from Dave, uh, Dave Manningly. Uh, he was wondering, in spy history, were microdots generally in very tiny clear text or were they also encoded? I'm sorry. Did you hear me in there? No, I don't think I could hear you. Sorry. Oh, I apologize. Let me get this going by hearing. It might have been it might have been me. Sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great, great. Okay, so sorry. First question uh, was from Dave Manning. He's wondering in spy history, uh, were microdots generally in very tiny clear text or were they also encoded? Um, so they, you could see them in both. Uh, generally, they were encoded, though. So if they were used in wartime, they would they would probably encode them. Um, yeah, you, most of the examples I've seen have been encoded text uh, committed to microdot. Um, just it's just as an added layer of security. So the entire process here is a process of security through obscurity, ultimately, um, which we tend we tend to um, we tend to look down on in, in modern digital security. But there's, there's, you can't undercut the fact that there may just be an application where obscurity is going to help you out quite a bit. Um, in the event that I lose this, it's you're not going to find these things. I mean, like I, I only found it because I knew that I dropped it in the general vicinity. Like I, Jeff saw me drop this thing, and I was like, I instantly did not know where it went. So if you're if you're making microdots, the perishability of the data is like almost instantaneous if you if you it would get vacuumed up in my house easily so encoding it is is just kind of an added bonus to to putting it on a microdot okay great thanks and uh so susie asks uh, if this was similar or is there some maybe some overlaps to microfiche of years ago yeah there's a lot of there's a lot of overlap um the the two technologies are basically the same thing so um whereas microfiche is meant to take an entire archive and make it small enough for storage um, the the original intent, as I as I kind of went over in the early slides, was to make it easier for for a, a homing pigeon to carry it. Um, but yeah, the, the another kind of modern instantiation of this is to take entire libraries and and shrink down the information into something that's just easier to store. So it's essentially the same technology. Um, you're you're using the same film stock if you really want to get one that's that's in good condition, and readable. <laughs> So yeah, there's there's definitely overlap I there. Guess you, I guess you went to okay. <laughs> to reset everything. Uh, see. Mark asks, uh, or maybe a, a more of a comment you can elaborate on. So it doesn't seem like there's any equipment needed here that seems particularly incriminating. Maybe that's by design. Uh, yeah, there's there's really not. Um, there, there's there's nothing incriminating about the technology that I used here, uh, and in part that that. That could be by design. I believe the British method was probably created for that specific purpose. Um, but yeah, I mean, you could go through the trouble of, of buying a very old Minox camera. I don't know that anybody really produces these things anymore. So if you wanted one, it would probably be an antique in the first place. Um, but but yeah, there's you're you're not using any any specialized equipment here. And I was actually one of the things I was super shocked by when I started doing this project was that I didn't need to the the most specialized piece of equipment that I bought that because I didn't have it was an exacto knife. But everything else is is just you would probably have it around the house. You could do this easily. Yeah. yeah. Uh, maybe a follow-up question uh, from Dave. Since most modern cameras have autofocus, uh, he's wondering if older cameras work best. I would imagine that probably older cameras do work best. Um, you're going to need to have the manual focus because a lot of times these documents are going to be just small enough that you're not going to be able to focus in on them with autofocus. Yeah. It's a good notation. Um, not a problem I ran into because my single lens reflex camera is uh, is manual uh, by default. So I would have to switch on autofocus in order to get that, that feature. OK, great. Uh, another question. Um, is the information content of a micro dot more limited by the resolution of the film or the maximum distance between the camera and the object? So I would say that it's, it's more the resolution of the film because the smaller that you're getting it, the more contrast you're going to have between the, um, uh, the characters and the, the, just the kind of natural background of the film stock. 
So mm -hmm. in my case, what I experienced was a, a much more pronounced difference in um, or a much a much higher limitation, I should say, in uh, film stock than I did just the distance between my my lens and the the image. Now I, I would say that if I wanted to do like a one a one stop or a, a one stage film uh, product that that got me a micro dot, that would probably be easier than um, doing the focus on the two stage because focusing in on the on the like thirty five millimeter. Um, negative is, is not to be understated how difficult that is. There's, you're really, it's a guessing game. There's just really no way of knowing whether you're in focus or not, at least in, in the way that I did it. So it turns out that I think it probably was relatively in focus when I took the photo, but the, the lacking quality of the film stock just didn't make it readable, but you can kind of, you can tell what it was for sure. If you knew what you started with. So I'll consider that a victory. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's impressive. Uh, see so a follow-up uh, here uh, from Dave. If I remember right, aren't negatives usually mirror imaged? So would a micro dot usually come out reversed unless some sort of steps were taken? Yeah, that's that's an interesting question and one that I thought of. That was actually I had a conversation with Jana Mendez on the phone. Jana used to uh, she used to work for the the agency, and right. she was chief of disguise for many years. Uh, one of the things that I asked her before I started the two step or the two stage was like is this going to be reversed? Do I need to worry about that? And she's like, I don't know. So, uh, so I ended up having to kind of um, figure that one out on my own. But I, I think the reality of the situation is that the negative itself is visible from both sides. So whether it's reversed or not, doesn't actually impact the end state product with this technique, or at least I didn't experience it in a, in a way that really I ran into any problems. Now, again, it's not, it's not, it wasn't terribly readable on the on the micro dot version, so I I can't say that with one hundred percent certainty, but I don't believe I had any reversing. I think it I think it was as it should be when I when I when it came out ultimately. So good question though, something I had to deal with. Yeah, a little mind boggling. Uh, yeah. Uh, so another one here. Uh, could you put a micro dot on a projector slide and shine it on the wall to make it readable? Does that work? Um. So in, in film, in my, in my high school days, I was a film student, I was a photography student, and we had, uh, we had special rigs in order to take a 35 millimeter film stock and put it onto, um, put it onto like a, a piece of uh, negative paper. And the way that you would do that is with a thing called an enlarger. And so you'd put the, the negative in, mount it inside the enlarger, and it's basically like an overhead projector that just shines light through and projects the image larger on like a mat at the bottom. So uh, yes, the answer is yes. You can technically do this if you have a large enough apparatus to do that. Um, I, I believe that that, I mean, that's definitely specialized equipment. That's not even something that I, I think you'd find in, in a standard dark room at a, at a college university or anything. So you can do it, um, but it's, you're going to, you're going to have to find some very specialized analog technology to help you do that for sure. Okay. 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 Great. 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 Um, um, hey, Tracy, Tracy's asking, I didn't lose any. I mean, I, I lost them and refound them. So if you want to count the times that I lost them, uh, five in the last 12 hours, five times um, in total, I, I think it was the same tricky micro dot that I have. And I have like two of them. So I lost one and refound it five times in the last 12 hours. But this is the only, the last 12 hours is the only time I actually had any loss of them. So uh, I, Previous to this, I was doing it with the the lick the finger and and dab it uh, uh, method of of micro dot wrangling. So it, it worked. Um, it's fairly successful. Great. Uh, a couple of people were asking, what do you think about the idea of a QR code on a micro dot? Modern yeah, one? yeah. That was another that was another kind of digital hybrid that I was thinking of. So you could increase your bandwidth for transfer by putting a QR code onto micro dot and having it. Um, be readable for somebody maybe who you wanted to like, you wanted to get them information, but you wanted to um, give them an added level of security or find a way to transfer something more information to them. You could, you could hypothetically do this. I think it would be relatively labor intensive to do that though, because then they would standard technology is not going to be able to take a picture of a QR code that's in a micro dot. So 
um, you could potentially, you know, one thing I, I could try if I wanted to continue with this experiment is to get one of those lenses that you can attach to an iPhone that will let you take like um, um, micro photography. Um, mm. That may be something that you could do in order to try to get a good shot of it. I don't know whether that would work. In theory, mm. it would work. But actually getting the, the QR code to be readable itself would be um, challenging, I think. Yeah, yeah. OK. Uh, then uh, the last question, I think, is uh, is just the basic, like, what made you want to do this? <laughs> Where did you yeah, get the idea? So, yeah, so so this was when I, when I, I started writing this uh, zine called The Teletypist about a year ago. And The Teletypist is just kind of the output of all of my work for doing, uh, doing it's a project that I call the Hacking History Project. So I work with a couple other people on this and the entire intent here is to um, put in Freedom of Information Act requests to the government and have them give us information back on old hacks and old hackers, um, I've been fairly successful with this. And so my my goal here was to every year publish a new um, version of this zine with kind of updates on the last year's progress. And there's a, kind of an underlying narrative structure to it. Uh, but what I wanted to do when I first started this project was to put something that I called uh, added value into every issue. So in the first issue, I had an RFID sticker that if you got one of the physical copies, you would... Um, uh, you would be able to dump the information from the sticker in, in raw form and uh, you would be able to pull the hex out of it and then translate the hex. Um, I think maybe one person did this, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's for my own entertainment. So the reason that I started doing this was to, to have some added value for the second issue. So if you're interested in having a micro dot, uh, wow. look out for issue two of the teletypist because there wow. may be some some added value here in this in this pill case um, <laughs> when I get around to, to actually publishing it. So that's that's why I did it for, for fun and for not profit. Okay, great. And then uh, we'll probably leave uh, maybe with uh, just a couple of dad jokes I think we collected during there are a lot, but I collected a couple of them. I, I, um, I'm pleased by this. <laughs> <laughs> there was a question about would a micro Pac-Man eat, eat micro dots uh, was the first one. Uh, and then the second one, or maybe the better one, uh, was would Aquarium News articles be stored on microfiche? <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm, so, I'm groaning on the inside. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah, it's a, yeah. <laughs> we, need a, we need a whole track or a whole channel just for uh, yeah. uh, the various bad jokes to come out there. It's Thank you very fun. much for uh, for doing this. This is a uh, uh, really interesting, really informative, and uh, yeah. just a nice, nice deep dive into all the technology behind this. Great. Um, thanks, thanks feel, everyone for coming. Feel free to uh, to uh, connect with people uh, go through your uh, Twitter handle and all that kind of stuff into the the chat, so people have got that. Uh, feel free to stick around, and uh, thanks again for the great talk. Appreciate it. Thanks, bye everyone. Yeah.